Welcome, friends, to Game Master's Studio, where we talk shop about running tabletop role-playing games. With us today is Jared and Ed, with your host, Jerry. Hey, welcome to the Game Master's Studio. I'm Jerry, a.k.a. Frieden. With me is Jared a.k.a. DMF, and Ed Prez Collins. Hello. We are going to be doing this as our first bonus episode. The bonus episodes are a side track to the regular podcast. These are episodes that you can feel free to skip, uh, and there's a few of them that we have mixed in here that are going to be ones we almost kind of hope you don't have to listen to, dealing with problems and issues. But we're starting off on a little more lighthearted side. Uh, if you're going to be listening to the podcast, you're going to want to wonder who these people are. What right do we have to be telling you anything about running games? So we thought we'd take a little while and share some of our backgrounds, share some of our styles, some of our stories, just so you can get to know us a little bit, just so we have a little bit of credence when you're listening to the shows to kind of help take some of our advice to help your games out. Um, I'll kick things off a little bit talking about my background. Uh, Like I said, my name is Jerry. I go on by the online handle of Frieden. Um, I have been playing role-playing games longer than I can remember. Uh, my brother and I started with the Red Box D and D, which my dad got for us when we were kids, and I started. We took turns running that. I've played Advanced Dungeons and Dragons first and second edition, and then moving into Dungeons and Dragons third, three point five. Played fourth edition, and contrary to popular opinion, I actually enjoyed it. Had a good group, had a lot of fun with it. Currently running fifth edition, enjoying that as a new system. Uh, I've also played Warhammer. Uh, Vampire, White Wolf in the World of Darkness, uh, Werewolf and Hunter as well, Star Wars, Paranoia, GURPS, Feng Shui, Mutants and Masterminds, Deadlands. I have just a wide variety of things that I've played because I had a group that I was working with for a while where we compiled our games that we had available to us and had over 70, 80 games. We didn't get a chance to play them all, but we had the experience of being able to look through the rules, see what different games did, get a lot of ideas there. So I have a large variety of experience to draw on. Um, Speaking of experience, I always kind of kick off the shows mentioning DMF being proprietor of of Mad Doc Designs, designer of the World of Wrath, and uh, also semi-professional GM. So I've built you up. Jared, why don't you tell them a little bit about your background and see that you've uh, earned those credentials. Well, uh, again, I am Jared, a.k.a. DMF. I have been playing since I was 15 years old. I'll be 34 next month, so I'm pushing about 20 years of experience, uh, both playing and DMing. I have started DMing just a couple months after learning how to play, believe it or not. Not something I would necessarily recommend, but it got me right into the swing of things. I have been playing since D&D 2nd Edition, Advanced D&D. I played 3rd Edition 3.0, 3.5, skipped 4th Edition. 4th uh, Edition I skipped just because of the, where I was in my life. I wasn't really playing any role-playing games at the time, so I had nothing to do with the system. Don't take that out of context. I did pick back up again for 3.5 and go into 5th Edition. I am completely enthralled with 5th Edition. I think it's great. I think it's simple but not stupid. Uh, I've also run Call of Cthulhu and Exalted. I've played a variety of other games, but those are the systems that I have run as a GM or DM. Um, as far as you know, other experiences. I mean, I've done a lot of things. I also write. You know, I, I, there's a lot of things that have added to what I believe to be you know a good background for a DM, but by no means any any real rule. I've read a lot of systems that I've never run or even played. Uh, I just think that there's no such thing as knowing enough as a DM, and you can always bring little tiny bits from other systems into uh, the system that you're running. So, like Dungeon World, that game doesn't even use dice, so it's a, it's a very interesting system. Just kind of do a little mini shout out to that. So that's kind of where my experience lies. Um, I really don't think that... There's really much else to say, unfortunately, for my experience. I haven't run 70 or 80 games like Jerry, or uh, had access to 70 or 80 games like uh, Jerry does, but or did. 
We specifically built up a library. I think there were games that were purchased solely for the intent of adding to the collection, yeah. and nobody was actually interested in playing. <laughs> uh, specifically, I'm looking at Street Fighter, the role-playing game. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and between the three of us, we do have over 60 years, or I think I did the math around 60 years of, of, of DM experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, we don't hit that number without... Ed's experience in there, so why don't you explain a little bit about uh, what you've done and where you're coming from. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Jerry, unlike you, I actually do remember a time before gaming. Uh, and I call those the Dark Ages. Uh, but uh, I've, I've been gaming for about 18 years now, uh, GMing most of that time. Jared, kind of like you, uh, just a few months in, I was you know, uh, running my own game there. Uh, a uh, fun little fun little vampire game where I remember my first combat I forgot to have the bad guys go at all so fun little learning experience uh, you know like these guys I've played you know lots of D and D everything from uh, uh, really from second edition to three point five I want, got into Pathfinder um, I was uh, amongst the uh, ranks that uh, did not play fourth edition because it just seemed so foreign uh, but from uh, what Jerry tells me I, I actually kind of missed out so. Uh, uh, but I'm on fifth edition now. I, I love the system. I think it's great, balanced. You know, uh, has it's, uh, has a lot of strengths. Um, uh, it's a really good system. Uh, most of my experience also uh, lies in the Rifts uh, multiverse. Um, uh, Rifts is a system. You know, the the basic idea is that there anything can exist in the the multiverse. There's rifts opening up everywhere and. Uh, uh, mo- most of most of what I've played in that has been under the Heroes Unlimited scope, uh, where you get to play superheroes. So that's pretty cool. Uh, played Call of Cthulhu, GURPS, Fudge, Lord of the Rings, Shadowrun. Uh, I've run an eFed for a while. Any uh, eFedders out there? Shout out to you. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much my experience there. Yeah, I've, I've worked in the eFeds as well. Although I, when I tell those stories, I tend to talk about more in terms of freeform role playing yeah. rather than specifically going with efeds. Hmm. Um, so, Ed, since we went over to Jared before, uh, let's start with you. As we're going down the questions, um, what part of game mastering do you enjoy the most? What what do you what makes you want to sit behind the screen each week? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, there's. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things to like about GMing if you like GMing. And I think, honestly, I think it's that I like it. I enjoy it. I get a lot of pleasure out of actually just being uh, a GM or a dungeon master. Um, you know, you, you go to your regular job. You don't necessarily like like your regular job, but you do it, you know, 40 hours a week to pay the bills or, you know, whatever you do. But uh, the GMing, the time I spend there, I'm able to be productive. I do something that I like. And when I when I do do a good job and I get the positive feedback, that's that's always that's always a treat too. Right. Um, Jared, for you, why 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 do you go into to GMing? Why do you sit down and give it a shot? I'm a big fan of being the the guide or the narrator of the story. That's kind of where my shtick and my kick is. Uh, I really like being the one that that brings the players along on the adventure, brings them down the journey, uh, helps guide them through, you know, the 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 would be uh, world of pain that they could be endeavoring in. Um, I'm very much the the kind of DM that likes to have, you know, to highlight that the players are the heroes of the story, and I go out of my way to make sure that that is the way that it is. But that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be challenged. I think that's a very important thing, is to let them be the heroes, but to challenge them as much as possible. I am notorious for killing players, so I don't think that my games are easy or a pushover. Um, but that's really, uh, I think that's just kind of what I enjoy doing is, you know, I have a lot of ideas, and I think the best way to be able to enact a lot of ideas in the D&D world or in any kind of, you know, role-playing world is actually be the guy behind the screen, because you're never going to have enough time to role play them all out if you're the player. <laughs> so I get to have a lot of characters that have, you know, I've got to, uh, you know, spring forth from my head and let the players kind of guide themselves through the world and see what happens. Very nice. I'm, uh, I'm in there again. It's it's what I like to see going on. You know, when I'm looking over the over the metaphorical DM screen, anybody who's actually played with me knows that I prefer to actually play without a screen. Um, but we use it. I like to see those players 
you know, you're putting together the story. I've, I've built something. I try to drop hints. I give foreshadowing. I have recurring characters. And to see people playing the games and putting the pieces together and remembering like, oh, remember this guy said that, that means this, and these guys are connected this way. Um, just the last session, I had the PCs talking with another group and the group is talking about something and the player playing the paladin suddenly entirely out of character just goes, oh, this all makes sense now. Um, and that's just a great moment for me to see people put the stuff together with all that foreshadowing because it shows that they're paying attention. They're engrossed. They're engaged. They they want to be here. They want to be in this game. And to see that come together is a lot of fun for me. Uh, moving along, since my, my answer for the next one kind of connects right in here, what is your favorite moment as a player? Um, connecting in with the whole putting the pieces together... I had a great scene uh, in one of my old games that I was playing in. It was a Project Twilight game, a small game with me and another player playing a pair of FBI investigators. Uh, if you're not familiar with Project Twilight, it's essentially the X-Files in the world of darkness. So there's vampires and werewolves and ghosts and magic. And the players are kind of investigating, covering it up. And the storyteller always had very detailed storylines on these, and he knew what was going on because he had no idea how we were going to approach it for investigation. So he had to have all his bases covered. And we got called in to check a firefight because my character was a, a ballistic specialist as a forensic analysis. And we did the mapping, like we sketched out a map. Okay, where were the bullet holes? Where were the casings? Where were footprints? Where were tire tracks? Where were blood stains and splatters? And putting all this together. And at the end of the session, you know, I, I did the whole Willem Dafoe boondock saints. There was a firefight moment and put it all together um, with the exception of Willem Dafoe making a mistake here or there. Uh, the storyteller said that I pretty much got everything spot on. He always shared at the end what was going on so that we as players knew, even if our characters didn't. And that was just one of those sessions where he's like, you got it. You got everything. There's so many details that you picked up on that I didn't expect you to. And it was just a great feeling from a player to be able to... I'm playing a character who this is their specialty. And as the player, I did it and I did it perfectly. Um, so much fun there. Um, let's go. Jared, as a player, what would you say your favorite moment was? Well, uh, when I was younger, I think this kind of stems from my Magic the Gathering days. I was all about finding the synergy. You know, you find the synergy between this card and this card works to do this kill trigger and boom, you win. So I used to be kind of what you know you would call a power gamer when it came to making characters, and with that kind of background, uh, I'm not like that anymore as much as you know. I, at least I don't think so. <laughs> um, yeah, but so with that kind of being said, one of my favorite moments was actually when I had a character that was handed more power than he should have been, and I took advantage of that like a bad person, and uh, made like the blaster of blasters. It was 3.5 was the, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons. I was playing a Scion, uh, Kineticist. And I was able to, in one session, single-handedly kill two Great Worm Dragons and mortally wound another. I killed a red and a blue Great Worm Dragon and mortally wound the white, which then fled like a little cowardly girl. And I'm bitter about not having gotten that final shot into this day because I <laughs> wanted to make it three. And if the green didn't run away, I would have killed that one too. <laughs> um, but yeah, so just you know, being able to be that 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 Superman moment, that you know, hero that saves the day. Uh, I had to again single handedly take on these great worm dragons while my party was dealing with the the army foot soldiers. Uh, after dealing with and running back all the dragons, I then had to come down and save the party. Again, my character was way overpowered. Um, I, I get crap about it from the other players to this day um, because it turned into the Varagash show, quote unquote. Uh, but yeah, it was still kind of really nice being able to have that moment where you get to, you know, crash through the window and save the day kind of deal. You know, you don't get to have that very often, uh, and you don't get to be a, a godlike character very often. Uh, usually, you know, it's you know, honestly, it's kind of a DM's fault to to let your characters get out of control. But it, you know, as a player, it can be a really nice moment to have. So I guess that would have to be one of my favorite moments. I have others, but. I always get a tickle out of knowing that I single-handedly almost killed three Great Worm Dragons in one session. 
yeah, that's that single player moment that's just totally off the hook. Always a lot of fun, uh, which I know Ed kind of yeah. shared his moment earlier. So uh, you can go ahead because I know it's right along the same vein. Yeah, I got one of those too. Just from a pure numbers standpoint, I was a level seven character. Uh, the the GM had purposely made us overpowered for this game. We were playing Gestalt characters, and this was in fifth edition. And I'd made myself both a, a rogue and a paladin Gestalt. I had no idea what was coming up, but at one point, um, I got a critical sneak attack and ended up rolling. Uh, oh, and of course, I added my uh, smite to that. Ended up rolling ten d eight plus eight d six plus my bonus. And did over, and it, including exploding dice, did over 120 some odd damage to a Tarrasque. Now, the sucker turned around and bit me in half and swallowed me whole after that, but uh, that was a pretty epic moment numbers wise. But uh, I don't know, uh, as for role playing, uh, I really enjoy like in character discussions, you know, that point where you're, you know, you and, uh, you and another player are talking about a thing that's happening in game as those characters. I think that's really cool. Yeah. And I got to say, with, with your moment with the Tresk, I think the fact that your character died off of it doesn't diminish it at all. It's still a great. Oh, yeah. Oh, I loved pick. it. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, last question that we have on the list. Um, and since you've actually kind of gone last twice, I'm going to let you go first on this one, Ed. Sure. Um, your favorite moment as a DM. Wow. Uh, you know... I'd have to say there was a campaign that I ran. I started my group at level one. This is a third edition, maybe 3.5. I think it was third. And uh, long campaign. There was this recurring NPC that would show up from time to time. Um, and the the third like section of this game, or, or act, I should say, the third act of this long game, kind of revolved around him and his story and that sort of thing. And... Uh, I had actually done inadvertently a good enough job at setting this game up, setting this character up, that at the end of the game, when he finally sort of made kind of a sac final sacrifice for the group, something they knew he was going to have to do, and he did it anyway, you know, and he did it, you know, wholeheartedly, despite having started as a villain, uh, I actually had a, a player, a g very genuine player reaction where he actually had to wipe a tear away because he was so involved in the game and his own character and this character as well that was it was all coming to an end and it was just kind of uh kind of an emotional moment so that was a really cool i think a really cool moment to be able to spark that kind of a you know positive reaction and emotion from uh from a player through something as fun as D, &D you know nice nice poignant moment to yeah to tenderly connect yeah um and then we have the 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 story you entered in on a little bit different emotions coming out of your players, Jared. Uh, yeah. You want to go ahead with that one? Uh, yeah, definitely elicited an emotional response, but no, <laughs> on a different end of the spectrum. Um, one of my favorite moments is what I refer to as the leprechaun or death moment um, <laughs> in honor of Eddie Izzard's uh, Dress to Kill stand-up where they have the skit of cake or death. Because uh, it really kind of came down to that. Like Literally, they were handed this opportunity, and they could have either chosen to eat the cake or die, and they chose to die, and that just uh, really um, kind of caught me um, by surprise. So the situation was that they're um, the the group of players are all stuck in the Fey realm, and they're all actually imprisoned and awaiting sentencing by a, an entity known as Gaia. The entity that uh, imprisoned them all is basically telling them that, you know, in his opinion, in its opinion, that Gaia is going to sentence them all to death and murder them all for being, quote-unquote, pollutants, for being humans and humanoid kind in the Fey Realm. They don't belong there. They're what's wrong with the world, blah, blah, blah. Um, but moving on, they had befriended this fairy, and the fairy actually is able to, in the middle of the night, you know, free them from their, their cell, and they all get away. So they're all, you know, le you know, they're ex exiting the the prison. They're, you know, a couple miles away. They're on their, you know, trying to find their way to freedom, and they're interrogating the. Well, inter I say interrogating, but they're, you know, they're questioning the fairy for information, like how do we get out of the fairy realm? They didn't want to be there. It was an accident that they got there, and the the fairy retorts with the only person that it knew of, other than Gaia, that would be powerful enough to send them back to the material plane was a leprechaun, 
And on that note, the party stopped, frozen its tracks, turned around, and walked its butt back to the cell and locked themselves back up, awaiting sentencing to be presumably be killed. As one of the players, I'd like to point out that we literally walked back and l- walked ourselves back into the same cell. Yes, <laughs> they walked right back into the cell, locked themselves back up, and awaited sentencing, presumably to die in the morning, because they would rather face death or take their chances with Gaia than deal with a freaking leprechaun. Now, I thought that was hilarious. I couldn't help but laugh. It was just one of the like one of the most ridiculous things that I thought I, I could have imagined to have happened. I didn't foresee that at all. And unfortunately, I can't take too much credit for that because at that point, I had never introduced a uh, Leprechaun as an NPC. So it wasn't anything that I had done. It was just the pure reputation, uh, reputation of Leprechauns in general that made them freeze in their tracks and lock themselves so, back up. So you hadn't run a Leprechaun or like a trickster imp of some sort? No. And they just said, screw it, we're leaving. They were just like, Leprechaun, frig this, <laughs> I'd rather die. <laughs> and on an even more hilarious note, in the same... Uh, adventure, two or three sessions later, with the same group of players, I introduced a leprechaun, and they instantly went along for the ride. Oh, jeez. Didn't second guess them at all. The whole, of course, what did I do? The leprechaun ended up backstabbing him. It was a trick the whole time. But yet, the idea of a leprechaun, when facing death, they chose death. But the second I introduce, actually introduce a leprechaun, they just join his ranks and go along for the ride and let themselves get tricked. So I just thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, just one there were moments. extenuating circumstances. There were extenuating <laughs> circumstances, but I just always thought it was funny that they, they never really questioned what came out of his mouth. Well, we did. We just It was too late. <laughs> um, which, actually, nice unintentional segue there, because that's kind of into my DM moment when it comes to questioning what comes out of people's mouths. Um, I was running a one-shot for some friends of mine with Warhammer Fantasy, and they were contracted to go to this other town and pick up a holy relic from the Church of Sigmar. So the three players, the wizard, the warrior, and the ranger, traveled to the town, and right about the time they got there, the ranger's player had to run out and run some errands. So he said he'd be back in 20 minutes or so, and the player headed off. We decided the character would stay outside of town and start setting up camp. Well, the wizard and warrior went into town to meet up with their contacts at the church and secure the artifact. So they go in and they start asking people, hey, where's the church in town? And they're getting told, it's not around. We don't have a church. We're not religious people. Um, This would be roughly like going into uh, a town in America today and say, hey, where's the nearest McDonald's? And you're getting people left and right that are going, McDonald's? Never heard of it. Hmm. Um, It's just that prolific, you know, the Church of Sigmar. If you've ever played Warhammer, you understand that how strange it is that people don't know. Um, so they explored the town. They found the church itself. It's all like boarded up. They break in and it's dusty. It's been abandoned for months. So they grab a passing villager and they say, hey, you know, what what building is that over there? You know, pointing to the church. And the villager's like, no, no, that's, that's just an empty field. There's no building there. There hasn't been a building there for years. So they try to to drag the villager into the to the building that they can see, and apparently he can't. And he punches the wizard and runs away, yelling for the guards. The players decide that this would be a good time to head out of town at the moment, figure out what they're going to do next. And the ranger's player returns from running his errand. So he hadn't heard any of this game going on, and they come back to meet up with him, and they're telling the story. They tell him everything that happens, and he's quiet, and he's listening, and they explain what's going on. Um, they may not have had everything perfect, but as a DM, I'm obligated to not speak up and correct their errors, because if they miscommunicate, that's on them, not me. And they finished with it, and it's just the whole town has gone crazy. The ranger's sitting there, and he looks from one to the other, and he goes, are you sure? Are you sure the whole town has gone crazy and not just you two? Great moment for me as a DM because however briefly I made a PC doubt the other PCs. Um, so many times the players unconditionally trust what the other one has said. There's no secrets to be held in a lot of these groups. Everything is shared and out in the open and, and accepted unconditionally. And I just made him stop and at least consider the possibility that, hey, maybe these two are messing with me. Maybe they're lying. Maybe I can't trust them unconditionally. And to break people of that that habit that they get from years and years of role-playing just felt really good. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so for the last part that we wanted to cover here a bit, uh, just a little bit of feedback, because we've, we've talked about us as game masters. We talked about what we've, we've done. 
we actually like to give a little bit of this is our point of view on the other game masters and how they work and some of their strengths just so that not only is hey we're great but let's talk about other people telling how great we are so i'd like to just give a little bit of feedback on each of them having played in in games we've all played in games that each other's have ran um for ed ed has a wonderful attitude about saying yeah sure We'll go with that. And and the players want to go somewhere just completely off the rails. They want to like, okay, we need to go here. And instead of going there, we're going to take a 90 degree turn and go off and do something random and completely unexpected. And there's a lot of DMs that will try to guide them back. Like, no, this is where you need to be going. This is where you should be. He'll remind you, but he won't force you. It's always like wherever you're going, that's where you go. That's where you deal with it. And if you didn't go stop the bad guy and save the world, then eventually the world's going to be destroyed because you didn't do it. But he's never going to say you can't ignore the bad guy and go off and start in somewhere. And I've enjoyed that in games because that, that, that freedom to do whatever we want. Um, Jared, one of your biggest strengths that I like is the detail you put into the world. Um, he, as I've mentioned a couple of times, he's the, he's the creator of the world of Wrath. We've had several campaigns in the Wrath world, but there's also this deep history behind it. And things like, oh, there was a war with the vampires, which led to silver being taken out of circulation. So it's being used as weapons against the vampires. And that's why there's no silver. And everybody in the world just accepts that, you know, there are no, there just happen to not be silver coins, even though there's this deep, intricate story about why there's no silver coins. You know, having all those little pieces, the little background and stuff really helps helps make a world come alive and pop because you realize that there is a world. It's not just a framework for rolling dice and comparing numbers. There's a world, it's living, it's breathing, it's flawed. It's very much a gray versus gray rather than black versus white because everybody believes that they're doing the right things, even if not always 100% for the right reasons. Um, so, you know, let's go with uh, Jared. A little feedback on me and Ed as GMs. Uh, well, I'll start with you, sir. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, it's because why not? You're currently running the game that I'm playing. Um, uh, one of the big things that I like about Jerry is he is really good at faking putting the work in. <laughs> 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 I think most people at the table think that he spends all week, you know, desperately planning a lot of the details, but he's actually really good at improving. I think that's a good strength of his. Uh, and he also knows to have just enough planned, you know, that he can improv. You know, another uh, something that I like to do as well. Um, but, you know, you can kind of go where you need to go, kind of go where you want to go. And if you want to go somewhere that he had no idea that you were going to go there, well, he'll figure something out on the fly and make it work. Uh, I just think that's a good strength of his. You know, he's um, just really good at making you think that he's put a lot of work into it, which can make some people, you know, really appreciate like, oh man, you just, dude, I don't know how much time you spend at home working on this dude, but it's just, it's really awesome. So, you know, I think that's, I think that's a really strong skill to have is, you know, be able to improv. Um, where Ed, uh, sounds like from Jerry's experience, he has a very similar kind of skill going on that you can go places. I haven't played with Ed in a long time, so it's been, uh, I can't really give any current event uh, um, feedback on Ed, unfortunately. I look forward to playing a game with him soon. Um, but I remember back in the day that he definitely had that going on. I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, because it's been about a decade, <laughs> but, um, I want to say that there was... It was Vampire, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was Vampire. I'm pretty sure there was like a scene where like we had like a gunfight around a car, and the car ended up like going in motion, and... It was, it was quite an intricate, and I think that was one of the things that I liked about best about it. It was like, it wasn't just a fight that took place on a street. Like, there was motion to it. You know, the, the fight moved. The car went into motion. Windows were breaking. People are inside the car. People are outside the car. People are chasing the car. Bullets are flying. You know, he just set a really good scene for the fight, which I think is a really important thing. It keeps people engaged instead of just like, I'm fighting three orcs in the middle of the field. You know, setting the scene. Um... So that's a really good, strong skill as well. And again, um, when I get to play a new game with Ed sometime soon, I'll give you a, a more updated feedback on that. <laughs> I think it's interesting that you brought up 
you know, strengths as improv versus prep and also, you know, setting up interesting action scenes, which are actually topics that we're looking at bringing up down the road. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. Those are a couple that I'm looking forward to. But, yeah. uh, but Ed, sorry that you're kind of last again. That was not intentional. But uh, And Ed. <laughs> yes. And, and Ed. Ed. Uh, well, you know, honestly, uh, so uh, Jared, for you. Uh, I actually it kind of rebounds off of what you said uh, there about setting up good scenes. We, again, where we haven't played in so long, the last game that I played with you, uh, you you did or, or that I played under you, you did set up very like dynamic uh, situations with unique and in just different situations would find ourselves in, you know, we went from, you know, playing in essentially, you know, uh, the lost world of Jurassic park where we're fighting dinosaurs to going into the Terminator where we're fighting, you know, robots uh, with guns and trying to kill us to, you know, going into, uh, uh, uh um, what was it Stargate where we're going up against, you know, uh, uh, dudes of blasters. Badass, yeah. That's <laughs> like, you know, where, uh, um, I can't think of the no, lycanthropes. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Lycanthropes, <laughs> werewolves with freaking uh, uh, blasters and whatnot. So you 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 change it up. You made it feel fresh uh, uh, all the time. And yes, the amount of work that I've seen that you've put into it, because you know when I went onto your frath boards and I saw all you know all the stuff that's on there, I'm like, holy crap! That's you know this is a good good list, a good compilation compilation here, and uh, all the. You know the map clearly has a lot to it, and, and and just all the different maps that you make and and that sort of thing. I was pretty impressed by that. Uh, so that's certainly something I, th- I think that you have uh, going for you there. And just as a side note, Jared's maps are available through his Mad Doc Designs and uh, on D20Pro.com's Ooh. website. You can uh, purchase them, and we maybe actually we've discussed building some of those to give away to listeners of the show. Yeah, yeah. Did I just uh, set up a plug there? <laughs> Very smooth. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, <laughs> I didn't plan this, I swear. <laughs> uh, and uh, for Jerry, I like... I, I maybe have a unique side to this because the game he's running now, he's essentially my ride. So we'll talk <laughs> about the game to and from the game a little bit. And, uh, uh, you know, amongst other things, but we do, we do usually come around to the game. And he uses some of the things that I say. And I don't mean that to, to say that I influence the game. But... He, I, I like how he takes my feedback and is willing to give me some of that back sometimes, you know, to, to, uh, I mean, the, the, the game itself, I, I, I think in passing at one point we had, I had mentioned something of, you know, I'd always like to play a, you know, a, a king that roams the country trying to build an army and that when he mentioned the kind of game that he wanted to run, um, I then, you know, it was like, man, I, I get the chance to do this now. And then I talked to him about that, and, and, you know, we mentioned a few things, and now there's that chance, that possibility for my character. So I really like uh, how the the player feedback also gets immersed into the game as well. So Yeah, the downside to that is anything that gets mentioned, if I already came up with that idea ahead of time, I'm like, now when I do this, they're, gonna, they're just going to say, oh, hey, I came up with that. <laughs> You've done that to me so many times. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we are pretty much running down on time, but I feel like this gives you a good idea of who we are, what we're doing. Um, We're going to have regular episodes coming up talking about various different topics for running a game, how to help you run a better game, how to avoid some pitfalls, how to help improve the games you're doing. Uh, We'll definitely welcome comments and feedback on the forums, and we're going to be setting up Facebook, Twitter, YouTube pages, so that you can obviously like, comment, and subscribe on all of those as well. And we will see you in the future at the gaming table and here on the podcast. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good one, guys. See ya. Have a good one, guys. See ya.